Stand by for action. Hello, I'm John J. Thompson, and I know you might be thinking that you've heard this setup before. The guest we have with us today on the True Tunes podcast is one of the most important songwriters and artists, one of the most influential in my life at least, and I can't believe I get to bring this conversation to you today. But that's only because these sentiments are true. As a teenager in the 80s, captivated by the power of smart edgy, purposeful, out-of-the-box rock and roll music, and haunted by a spirituality that permeated everything I encountered, Tony O.K. was an absolute lightning rod for me. He was connected to many of my other favorite artists, but his music was singular, unique. It's a jungle out there Used to be a garden But the times got tough You got Cain and Abel You got Jack and Jill They're out looking for love, love, love On a Saturday night in a Coupeville But love got twisted And the streets got mean Now everybody's got their secret as the night By the time I discovered Tony O.K., he was working with another of my heroes, T-Bone Burnett, and had just released an album called Romeo Unchained for a label called What Records. Surprisingly, What was a label putting out music for the growing, but still nascent, Christian rock market through word music, but with an eye toward mainstream music as well. A few episodes back, you heard us talk about that brilliant but doomed project with its head visionary, Tom Willett, who will also join us for this conversation today. Willett, along with Burnett, Mark Hurd, and others, had a vision to release thoughtful, excellent music that would be spiritually anchored and accessible to all, not at all unlike what you 2 The Call, and others were doing. Tony O.K., who had already released several albums for major mainstream labels in the 70s and early 80s, would be their first signing. And Romeo Unchained, a collection of studies of love in a world gone wrong, was electrifying. And this isn't just my opinion, and not just the opinion of those in the Christian music underground, either. Rolling Stone raved that it was the best Bob Dylan album since Dylan himself lost interest in the pop song form. Quote. And other press was similarly enthusiastic. As a 16-year-old kid, still reeling from the trauma of a terrifying childhood and clinging precariously to a countercultural faith of my own, the album was another lifeline, and I devoured it. Because nestled amongst the fun and cheeky satirical songs like Romeo and Jane, True Confessions, and I Handle Snakes were soulful, hopeful, romantic truth bombs like You Belong With Me. I fell in love with Romeo Unchained immediately and began hunting down all of Tony O'Kay's early, already out-of-print albums and EPs in Chicago-area used record stores. I enjoyed the heck out of Life in the Food Chain, America, and La Bamba, and bought up every used copy I could find so we would always have them in stock at True Tunes. Tony O'Kay was a priority artist for us, right up there with Bruce Coburn, Burnett, U2, and others. Babylon is babbling. Babylon is staggering. From Sunset Boulevard to Park Avenue to Paris to Peking, the dawn of history and on into the future. They go on and on and on. 
Kay was intelligent and oh so cool. He had a sense of humor that was unlike anything I had heard in rock music before. He made me look up the word sardonic in the dictionary after reading reviews of his albums. Major labels had expected him to become America's answer to Elvis Costello or Joe Jackson, in the same vein as Warren Zevon. But mainstream success evaded him. But with artists like Coburn, U2, The Call, and Simple Minds revealing an appetite on the fringes of alternative music for gospel-tinged rock, might there be a fit for him there? What followed up Romeo Unchained with the nearly perfect Notes from the Lost Civilization in 1988? Kay and co-producer David Miner ushered the album into a more organic space, ditching the drum machines and synths and pulling in a unified band sound. A who's who of roots rock musicians joined the cast, including drummer Jim Keltner, percussionist Alex Acuna, Booker T. Jones on B3, Mark Rabot on guitar, and legendary Motown bassist James Jamerson Jr., while T-Bone Burnett executive produced. Minor, who had also worked with Burnett on Elvis Costello's King of America album, gave the record a full, warm sound that was crisp, human, and jangled in all the right ways. A killer band and a flawless set of songs combined to bring forth an album that still ranks as one of the best ever released. We know how many near-perfect albums about love and heart and soul and faith are welcomed in this acid world, with a shrug. The single, Without Love, got some play on MTV, critics raved again, a tiny tribe lost their ever-loving minds over the thing, but that was about it. It was back to the drawing board for Kay, Minor, and Burnett as they hit the studio with many of the same musicians, as well as a few new faces, including David Hidalgo of Los Lobos, Paul Westerberg of The Replacements, Charlie Sexton, Bruce Thomas of Elvis Costello's band The Attractions, and others. The resulting collection, dubbed Olay, was a stunner. With what records deactivated at that point, the album had been funded by their mainstream partner a and who then never even bothered to release it. It finally saw light of day eight years later via the indie Gadfly Records, but Tony O'Kay's days as a viable recording artist were essentially over. His work, however, had only just begun. While the 80s had been a decade of creative excellence and professional frustration, 
the 90s flipped the script completely. K, long admired by music insiders for his otherworldly talent as a songwriter, became a hit songwriter. And I mean hit songwriter, like number one pop hits, cuts with people like Vanessa Williams, Tanya Tucker, Bonnie Raitt, Burt Bacharach, Robert Randolph, and even Dr. Dre. He's written with Steve Jones of the Sex Pistols and been covered by Bette Midler. His songs have been in Batman movies and slapstick comedies and romantic teen television dramas. His songs kept getting out there, impacting culture through other artists in ways his solo artist attempts never did. So, he largely retreated from the stage and the studio for the most part, but not from music. Well, I'm walking down this road with a smile on my face Although it's hard to explain in this world full of sorrow, trouble and tears, I've got a song anyway. As an enormous fan, really a student of his work as an artist and an admirer of his contributions as a writer for others, I have long wondered about this transition. How did it happen? Why did it happen? Why did Olay never get released? What went wrong? In the annals of the relationship between progressive art, rock and roll, and imaginative gospel thought, there have been few expressions as fully realized, as thrilling, as those released by What Records and the orbit that included Tony O'K, T-Bone Burnett, Tom Willett, Mark Hurd, Sam Phillips, and others of that ilk. If they couldn't pull it off, could anyone? My mind's a blank My life's a mess I've been under too much stress Got my personal story Got the six o'clock news It's all driving me crazy But the strangest thing keeps happening There have been precious few audio or print conversations with Tony O'K. I think I might have seen one interview, maybe two, over the last 25 or 30 years. So, when we started this podcast and I had my initial top 10 list of enigmatic, influential, important artists I wanted to host conversations with, K was high on that list. And now, finally... After an initial phone conversation, several emails, and a whole lot of support from our mutual friend Tom Willett, we finally got together at Willett's home for this incredible conversation. Because there is so much music to draw from, we will let the jukebox spill out with his own music, including some rarities, as well as songs he has written for others. If you are a fan, strap in for the Tony O.K. interview you have been waiting for. And if this is all new to you, get ready to hear another amazing, frustrating, beautiful story of stunning talent, fantastic music, long odds, and love that just won't die. Lord, teach me patience. Show me teach us forgiveness before All that and more, right after we take care of a little bit of housekeeping. Hello, my name's Rob, and I'm one of the Patreon backers of the True Tunes podcast. I'm honored to invite you to join me in support of True Tunes by signing up on their email list. 
I know email is often annoying, but by being on the list, I get notified when new episodes drop and when new articles get posted at truetunes.com. Sometimes, John even sends out short notes and gives away records and swag and stuff. Super cool. But really, the point is that by staying directly connected, I know that they don't have to pay Facebook or anyone else in order for me to hear from them, and that's important. They don't send out too many emails either, and I'm always happy to get them. So really, it would be helpful if you'd join me over here. You can find the sign-up link on the front page at truetunes.com. Oh, and don't forget to add John's email address, jjt at truetunes.com, to your contacts so that the emails don't get caught in your spam filter. And if you have any feedback on the show or questions, you can email him and he'll get back to you eventually. Thanks for listening. Hey, this is Ray, and I'm a Patreon backer of the True Tunes podcast. I have also left a rating and review of the show at Apple Podcasts. It wasn't that hard. It didn't cost me anything. But this show means a lot to me, and I know that reviews and ratings make a big difference when it comes to how and if others discover these conversations. Would you take a few minutes, maybe even while you're listening, but please, not while you're driving, to leave a rating and review? Even if you don't listen on Apple Podcasts, the reviews posted there push out to podcast platforms all around the world. Oh, and take some time to tell your friends about the show. Let's drive those numbers up together. Thanks. If you have not heard my conversation with Tom Willett, you definitely need to check that out. We actually have more of that interview that we are holding on to for another upcoming 45 RPM special episode. Tom and Tonio have been friends and co-conspirators for decades, so when I was invited to conduct this interview in person at Tom's home south of Nashville, I jumped at the chance. Tom's office, I came to find out, is loaded with Tony O'K artifacts. Willett, who ran What Records in the 80s, was an excellent host and contributed to the conversation as well. So, I invite you now to join me and my assistant engineer for the day, Mr. Tom Galata, at Tom Willett's home office in Franklin, Tennessee, for our long-awaited conversation with the one and only Tony O'K. Tony, okay. Thank you so much for joining us on the True Tunes podcast. It's an honor. First question, I guess we got to get out of the way is, you know, now that we're hanging out here and you haven't put out records in a while, is it still Tony? Okay, is is it it's Tony? Steve okay, in Tony? the in the music world. All right. You know, anybody who really knows me knows old Steve. But so I can refer to you as Tony. O. Yeah, yeah. All yeah. right. Cool. I want to talk about the early days, and I, and I know that some of those recordings were finally released. But tell me about when you were a kid, when you when music first got a hold of you, and mm-hmm. and I know a lot of people can remember buying records, consuming music, but some people it becomes something else, and they're saying, mm-hmm. no, no, I have to make this, I have to this. do that. Yeah, so tell me about your earliest encounters when you said this is going to be. Well, my the life. first album I was thinking about this. I think the first album I ever owned was given to me by a brainy cousin of mine, who went on to uh, uh, go to Harvard and become a lawyer. Uh, Alan Dershowitz was one of his professors. Oh, wow. Yeah. But uh, he gave me uh, Brubeck's Time Out album when we were kids. I mean, we were, I was probably 12 or something for, you know, Christmas or a birthday. 
So I started listening to that. Then I started listening to the Insomnia Inn out of San Francisco late at night. This is when I still lived in Central California. It was a kind of a jazz show. And I was sort of, you know, into that. And then along came Dick Dale. <laughs> it was like from Brubeck to Dick Dale. So loved it, you know, and had a cousin who lived in, or didn't, lived in, in 1967, but in the early 60s, they would go to a family member's beach house in Laguna Beach every summer, and I went with them, went to the Rendezvous Ballroom, wasn't old enough to drive, but was driven there and saw Dick there. And then one day after school in the ninth grade, um, the drummer in, in the Rake's Progress, wherever that is, which was nothing at the time, was taking drum lessons on a, a blue metal flake snare drum. That's all he had of the kit. And we were over his house after school. He also had a conga drum on a stand. And his father was a guitar player, a country guitar player, owned a body shop, auto body shop, but was a, you know, had a, I think a Chet Atkins or, you know, some nice old kind of hollow body electric. And we started playing Alley Oop. You know, the, the Steve Olson, the drummer on his snare drum, me on the conga, uh, this guy Alan Shapazian, who had played uh, uh, not pedal steel, but lap steel on a stand in country fairs with his little cowboy hat and fringed coat on um, and knew a little bit about playing guitar because his older brother had a Telecaster. So he starts playing the, the Chet Atkins, um, Gretsch I guess it was, yeah. And uh, I started singing, alley oop 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 oop. At the, at the end of the words. The, huh? <laughs> you knew the words. Yeah. <laughs> at the end of, of this, you know, when his parents came home or whatever happened and we stopped we seriously we pronounced ourselves a band yeah. and booked a gig for two weeks later at somebody's <laughs> sister's going away party to college didn't know any songs didn't know i didn't know how to play an instrument you know went out and bought a uh, from a pawn shop that my mother drove me to bought a broadcaster that looked like my friend's telecaster, friend's older brother's telecaster, that years later Albert Lee explained to me what that broadcaster was that I traded in for $25 credit um. on a Japanese base that electrocuted me later. <laughs> and my, my eyes went, he went, you what? Why did you do that? And I went, I don't know, I needed a real base and they offered me $25 for the broadcaster in, you know, 63, I guess this was. So anyway, became a band, played the gig, did surf music. We were known as the Vibrants until we saw James Brown in the fall of 63. I remember it was, it was pre-Beatles and somebody's girlfriend's big sister had the original Live at the Apollo album, the, the first one that I still have. I mean, it's actually prominently displayed at my house. Um, we were taken by the Big Brother with the Telecaster to the Fresno Memorial Auditorium to see the James Brown show that was the Live at the Apollo show. They were, you know, it was the exact show that's on that record, just at a different, different venue life-changing mm. you know it's like whoa you know and we immediately started doing james brown songs and i started singing them and we were off you know <laughs> wow that's that's i mean i was trying to sing those songs that's no small oh feat. yeah i mean and imagine <laughs> you know little 14 15 year old white kids singing please please <laughs> <laughs> right. with the cape with the cape <laughs> 
Oh, uh, no, but James Brown was, you know, musically Dick Dale got us into it because that was just too much fun to deny. But James Brown just killed us. Just, just like literally that life changing moment you were yeah. talking about. And then the Beatles came along and the Stones, and like all of us, here we are. Baby! When I was listening to the Rake's Progress stuff, for young people, you guys were pretty far down the highway towards even what The Doors and other bands were were doing later. Yeah, You were doing that kind of psychedelic, experimental, almost theatrical. Yeah, well, it was theatrical. And you were young, though. You weren't weren't even in college. We we got that record deal when I was... 16, um, made the record when I was still 16, actually. Summer of, of 66, we went to L.A., made the record at, I uh, forget the name of the studio, it was on 3rd Street in Larchmont. It was kind of a famous Liberty Records use, accessed studio, made the one single, um, that record that you're talking about, that was the one official single, which was Sewer at Love Chant, and Why Did You Rob Us Tank? <laughs> <laughs> tank was a friend and a roadie of ours who I don't think robbed us. I don't even know what, <laughs> I don't even know what we meant by that. You needed a story, right? <laughs> yeah, I wrote the words, and I don't know what it means. <laughs> but uh, made that record, and... and uh, yeah, we had most of those songs we had written and demoed in '65, and then we we got that record deal uh, in '66, early '66. What other ingredients were influencing you in terms of the counterculture, literature, film? There's got to be other things that were sort of sparking imagination well, to get you there. I must have been reading, and I don't remember reading this stuff, but because I know we ripped them off for lyrics, like Prisoner of Shion, I think was a Byron poem. So I must have been reading that. I don't, don't remember you know it's probably i remember reading mad magazine you know, but. <laughs> probably had to do it in school or something yeah. right? but uh that stuff and then we stole i don't know if it was me or nick but one of us stole from the library at the high school that i went to in in uh, sanger california stole an art book that had a chapter on Dada in it, Surrealism, Dada. And what we used to do is steal books, get an eraser and erase things out of pictures and then and then put, I don't know if you can put this in, put, you know, dicks and tits and things on, yeah, for intellectual on, on, other, stuff, on otherwise right. normal pictures. You know, yeah, right. very intellectual pursuit. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> You know, when you color them carefully. I think you were the first of billions of teenage boys to do that to their textbooks. So anyway, (laughs) well, we got to the chapter on Dada and sort of went, whoa, wait a minute, we don't need to do anything to these things. Check this out, Mona Lisa with a mustache, you know, the Duchamp thing and and all that stuff. So that was an influence, a lifelong influence uh, on me. Um, I don't remember reading a lot of heavy literature uh, in those years, 15, 16, 17, but I must have read some Byron and Shelley somewhere along the line, because I stole it. (laughs) 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 
was Liberty the connection, Liberty Records the connection to the Crickets? Uh, you know, it's funny, it wasn't. They were there at the time we were there. J.I., my, my friend and mentor, figured that out decades later. But no, we were on Liberty because <laughs> this same guy with the little fringe jacket and the cowboy hat, Alan Chapazian, lived on it. We were all basically farm boys. We lived out in the middle of nowhere in Central California in grape vineyards and lemon groves. And uh, Alan Chapazian's family ranch was up the road from, I forget the guy's first name, somebody Bagdasarian, who was, I don't think the brother, I think he was the cousin of Ross Bagdasarian, who his original hit was The Witch Doctor back in the 50s. And then I guess he realized from that recording that that high voice thing really played well with audiences. So he dreamed up the uh, the Chipmunks. That, right. was, that was him. He changed his name to David Seville, but all that stuff was on Liberty. And one day... Alan's dad said, oh, my boy's little band have just made some demos. Uh, uh, maybe we can play them for Ross next time he comes up here to visit his cousin down the road on you know, the next vineyard over. And did, and I don't know if Ross liked it or knew anything about it, but said, yeah, I'll take that back down to Liberty. And he gave it to Cy Ornick or Al Bennett or one of those guys who were Alvin, Simon, and Theodore. I forget who Ted was. <laughs> um, and they signed us. <laughs> you know? So suddenly Cousins we're in show business. Show. What were you doing between uh, Rake's progress and in the ensuing years that built your chops to the level that you could step in and become a member of the crickets i mean that's a legit band yeah, with, yeah 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 well you know for a few years in between i dropped out of the band and the band broke up the rake's progress because and i don't know oh, i don't care i was gonna say i don't know if i want this on tape because i in the finest american tradition had knocked up my teenage girlfriend and we got married and had little Monique, who just left here this morning. Um, and I moved back with my parents in Palm Desert. They had had the good taste to leave Central California and move to Palm Desert by then. So I went straight for a few years. I was a pre-law major and blah, 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 but still mostly reading English and continental literature in various classes. Then when we got divorced three years later you know i turned 21 in divorce court <laughs> <laughs> then the minute we were for sure done you know um nick and i rented a house we started writing songs and one of the rake's progress was working at a recording studio uh hollywood sound on selma in hollywood right next to Wally Hyders and the Sound Factory, those were both there. And we started doing demos with him because then he moved out to Devonshire Sound in the valley. And we were doing these demos, and I guess J.I. and Sonny, they were recording something in the, the other room at Devonshire Sound and heard what we were doing, and I guess liked the writing because they invited us into some other group that was to be an L.A. studio musician supergroup with like Hal Blaine and Joe Osborne and Larry Nectol and, and then J.I. and Sonny, who were both playing sessions as well. Um, 
and they invited us to be in that group. We didn't really play in it. We contributed a couple of songs. Nothing ever came of that. It, there was one single released that went nowhere. And in that group, I start hanging out with J.I. because we just kind of liked each other. Um, I say to J.I., J.I., what am I supposed to play in this band? Joe Osborne is playing bass, you know, uh, you know the guy that played on Bridge Over Troubled Water, you know, you don't, you don't need me playing bass in this band. And what am I supposed to play? And J.I. Si said, well, here. And he went and got an old guitar case. I don't think it had a rope handle. It had a real handle, a brown case. He opens it up, and in it is a black Gibson J200 with the double pick guards. And he goes, here, you know, borrow this. And he showed me the chords, you know, E, A, B, G, C, D, and how to make a bar chord, and maybe a couple of minors here and there. And he said, you know, here, now go learn how to play the guitar and write some songs, you know, because I was just writing lyrics and all our stuff. And so I did, you know. And then uh, one day I stopped by there, and they said, hey, so you've been writing any songs? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, play us some, you know. And Sonny hands me a guitar. And I played him a few things, including Hey John, which I noticed is in your list. Mm -hmm. And Joe O was there. And he goes, I believe Rivers would like that. Johnny Rivers. Yeah. And he said, <laughs> let's record that. Play that again. So I did. And they recorded it. And Johnny Rivers recorded the song. Never got released. It was for his L.A. reggae album. of, And really disappointingly, at this gig that we did, the Crickets did at the House of Blues uh, um, for the uh, Crickets and Their Buddies album that everyone played at, uh, Clapton and right. John Prine wasn't there because he was sick, but everyone that's on the album was there, Rat Rodney Crowell, you know, I forget who all. Rivers was there because he did a song on that, and backstage I, I go, hey, John, you probably don't remember me, but you rec you recorded a song of mine, you know, my first cut ever, blah, blah, blah. And he went, I don't remember that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know you. you know? <laughs> but yeah, he had no idea. You know? Hey, John, I read your book. I finally had to take a look. And you know I tried to close my eyes. It's all made up in lies Hey John I can't deny You sure as hell could probably cry it's amazing to me that that song is one of your first songs that you wrote, yeah. and then it's a cut, even if it doesn't get released. Yeah. You later put it on one of your records. That's, yeah, yeah. So we're able to hear the song, at least. And even that song is John the revelator it's yeah, yeah. it's a biblical song oh, a, yeah. a prophetic still kind of out the side of your mouth it's a little it's a wink and a nod it's a but you you've got this prophetic well it was perspective it was, going it was all the way from earnest, the beginning and i had and you won't be surprised to hear this if you haven't already guessed it I had recently read Late Great Planet Earth. Probably. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, okay. you know, and I, you know, uh, so I don't know if I had put any of that together in my own mind prior to reading Late Great Planet Earth, but that that was the main impetus for Do that. Do you remember just generally what your impression of the book was? Of Like, like did, were you taking that seriously? Well, were you? Well, I was kind of going, huh. You know, wow, yeah, okay, that makes sense. You know that yeah. that you know it was that the early early iterations of the whole Jesus movement in L.A. Right, and made as much sense to me as anything else. It's like really, well, I guess could be. You know, was your family gospel oriented Christian? Did you no, have a spiritual my perspective? My family was the was it the Armenian Holy Trinity something church that Orthodox. was yes it was yeah. somewhere between Greek Orthodox yeah. and Roman Catholic and Russian Orthodox probably yeah. closest to Russian Orthodox yeah. and I think part part of what appealed to it appealed to me about it in my 
later teenage years was that the priests in that thing wore capes and conical hats and things. <laughs> and they Glam probably rock. reminded me of James Brown. <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah, that's, I mean, it might have been the other way around, but there was right. some connection some with connection. the capes. There was some connection, yeah. <laughs> have the people recognizing you for your songwriting chops right out of the gate and then you end up playing with the crickets as a singer primarily right? yeah as a singer and rhythm guitar player and when we would do tours like i don't think i played much on those records we recorded because albert lee and sonny curtis were the and nick van marth were the guitar players so my services weren't needed right um and then on tours uh, of England that we would do I would do double duty on bass and rhythm guitar and singing depending upon Rick Gretsch may he rest in peace uh, was too strung out to play that night if he was too screwed up to play I would play bass and if he was playing bass I'd play rhythm guitar on uh, speaking of falling down the stairway backwards in England affecting my back, um, Rick was was traveling with Graham Parsons' Gibson Hummingbird that Graham had given him while they were co-producing Graham's last album. Graham wanted to go with us on the on the Winnebago to uh, to Nashville to record that stuff, and J.I. wouldn't let him because he just knew he is going to bring his kit and his drugs and we just can't have that in a Winnebago crossing Texas in 1973 <laughs> <laughs> so anyway he had I would play this Graham Parsons now owned by Rick Gretsch Hummingbird because the uh, the Gibson had gone back to Don Everly because we were at, we were actually at the gig when they broke up at Knott's Berry Farm. We were standing on the side of the ca- ca- the stage, J.I., Sonny, Albert, and me, watching this Everly Brothers gig, not knowing this was going to be the last Everly Brothers gig. And at some point, you know, within a few weeks after that, uh, apparently Don called J.I. up and said, hey, that black Gibson that... that I gave you, did I give you that or loan you that? <laughs> and J.I. said, no, man, you loaned it to me. And he said, yeah, could I get that back from you? I'll give you a couple of these new Gibson Everly models that Gibson's starting to make. But I just, I'm kind of sentimental about that guitar now that we've broken up, and I don't have one of those anymore. So J.I. gave that back to him, and uh, Rick loaned me this Gibson when I needed it on the road. And the, the 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 back component was we were backstage at some theater somewhere in the Midlands in England getting ready to go on. I have the Gibson on, or it must have been in my hand, and somebody's walking by, so I back up into a doorway to let them by, dark doorway. Only it wasn't a doorway; it was a stairwell. And I wind up going backwards down these stairs. And like W.C. Fields and his drink, all I knew was I got to keep this Gibson in the air and keep it from getting broken. This was Graham's Gibson. And I did. Um, Apparently wasn't injured. We went on. And I I don't remember hurting after because these back surgeons asked me about it because I said, could this have all come from something like that? And they said, eh. If you weren't noticeably injured at the time, probably not. You know, it might have hastened the arthritis that then grew in your spine and is part of the problem. I'm gonna tell you how it's gonna be. You're gonna give me your love. And I wanna love you night and day. You know my love will not fade away. You know my love will not fade away. 
were you conscious, cognizant at all during those years? Were you kind of trying to soak this up or were you just careening through the fact that you were in Buddy Holly's band playing on the road with legends? Were you cognizant of that or was it were you oblivious to that? Yeah, I was I was cognizant of it, but I was trying to be cool, so I never made a big issue out of it. But yeah, I was aware of it. Um I, I'm sure I told J.I. this, the first, that Brubeck album was the first vinyl record I ever owned. The first vinyl, re- oh no, you know what? That's not true. That was the first album I ever owned. The first record I ever bought was Peggy Sue. I was in bed sometime between eight and nine on a Sunday night because there was school the next day when I heard it coming through the wall and got up out of bed and went and watched it on Ed Sullivan and just was, you know, just, I just, I loved the song and was fascinated by the drums, you know, like, what are they doing there, you know? And and then I got my cousin Marilyn, who I guess was old enough to drive, uh, take me to the record department of the J.C. Penney department store in downtown Fresno um, and I bought that record on the Coral label. That was the first, literally the first record I ever bought. Um, and didn't buy a lot of 45s after that. Uh, and then, you know, went into my jazz period when I was given <laughs> the other thing. But yeah, I talked to J.I. about that. And wow. he actually gave me, and I still have it, when Rick and Albert and I were in the in the crickets in you know seventy two three four whatever year probably seventy two when this happened, we were all going show us the Buddy Holly memorabilia. So J.I. brings out this cigar box. It's got a little reel of eight or super eight millimeter film that he showed us that I guess he or his parents had taken. Um, but in the box, there's this beautiful hand-tooled Mexican silver money clip. And I went, wow, that's cool. Where'd you get that? And he said, oh, Peggy bought that for me on our sort of double honeymoon with Buddy and Maria in Acapulco in 58, the summer of 58. And I went, wow, that's cool. And he said, oh, you like that here? And I said, yeah, you can't give me that money clip peggy sue bought you that and he went out her <laughs> she, she's married to a roto rooter man living in sacramento now <laughs> oh my god <laughs> i still have it <laughs> oh my god it's amazing <laughs> At what point did you decide that it was time to step away from that well, heady when, time when it became obvious to all concerned that the cricket's audience was not going to accept anything other than that'll be the day and Peggy Sue and well all right and not fade away and that's all they wanted to hear and right. I think you know somebody bought that record but not a lot of somebody's those couple of records so we all just kind of moved on and and Mostly, they they moved to Nashville, J.I. and Joni and Sonny and Louise, and they all just wanted out of L.A. And I was still living in L.A., so I just kept writing. And the way it happened, actually, is I had gotten a publishing deal with ASCAP, um, and they gave me $1,500 to sign with them on the recommendation of another of the guys hanging out at J.I.'s house, uh, Bobby Russell, who was a huge ASCAP writer, had written Little Green Apples and Honey. And he had recommended to Herb Gottlieb, the president head of ASCAP at the time in L.A., sign this kid. So they did, and they gave me a $1,500 advance. 
And the way it happened is a few years later, I know this is what they were doing, someone from ASCAP called me up to see what I was doing and how I was doing, probably thinking about ever recouping their $1,500. <laughs> and I said, eh, I don't know, I'm not doing much of anything, just writing. And the guy goes, really, have you been writing a lot? And I said, oh, yeah, you know, I don't know how many songs at the time. And he said, well, come in and play them for me. Let me hear them. Maybe I can turn you on to a publisher. So I did, and he did, and... I went to uh, Eddie Reeves and John DeVarian at Intersong, I think it was called, yeah. and something else, and sat down with John. They were just moving into their offices and played him Funky Western Civilization and Hey John and I don't know what else. And like he literally, like in a movie, he stops the recorder. I, I don't think I was... I think I was playing him a tape, although maybe there was a guitar involved. And he said, okay, what do you want? You know, I don't know. I don't know. He's not thinking about pitching these to somebody else. He's thinking about yeah. you being an artist. Yeah, you know? yeah. He's going, what do you want? Let's do it. You know, and so I went, I don't know. You know, so then I, I got a lawyer through this guy Gary Katz that I knew that had made a couple <laughs> more Katz. just a, just a guy Gary oh, Katz. he was Steely Dan's producer yeah, right yeah. <laughs> yeah oh so you knew that <laughs> <laughs> he had taken me into village and done some demos with me also prior to this that's right we're talking about the good life in the food chain love of all the ruins I guess that you finally come to accept that there's nothing And the style that you end up landing on from the very first record is, again, kind of like what you were doing in the 60s with your friends. It's ahead of the curve. It's okay. It's got that punk snarl, but it's smart and sophisticated at the same time. It's yeah. It's a little bit more like what's going on in England, maybe. But yeah, and and a yeah. little bit influenced by the really old stuff, the crickets, you know, right. the proto rock stuff. Yeah. So yeah. how much of that was? D did you engineer? Did you think through it? Did you have a plan, or did you just? It's just crash the, through it's just and the just way it do came it. out yeah. like like the song life in the food chain was actually kind of more of a i don't know if you'd say rockabilly but more of a proto rock thing that i was actually thinking maybe someday i'll record this with the crickets you know mm -hmm. after you know the crickets were no more but i thought oh, you never know right and the rest of it. I mean, boom, 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 boom. Right. You know, yeah. I was thinking, oh, yeah, maybe we could do that someday. Right. It's got all the DNA that you that those of us will, will kind of recognize throughout the rest of your catalog. It feels so put together for a debut. How old were you when that came out? In my 20s. Yeah, right. You know, you were asking about influences. My biggest influences lyrically beyond Lord Byron, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Stealing from Lord Byron uh, or Shelley or whoever it was, um, were Zappa, the Freak Out album in particular, okay. and all you know the Dylan stuff going forward. We were we had in 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 that little band you know formed in my friend Steve Olson, the drummer's house in Sanger, California. His mother was from Minnesota. And one day sat us boys down and said, I want to play you this Minnesota boy. And played us early Dylan, you know, all the way through, you know, I don't, I don't know which record, but it was like, whoa, really? You can, you can say things like that? You know, <laughs> wow. you can do that? It doesn't have to be Moon June and my baby. You know, that registered with me. He was sitting there eating 300 pounds of pure green. He motioned to join him, said I can talk while I eat. I hit the recorder, thanked him for taking his time. He said, do your interview, son, cause time is money and it's your time. Said I'm a second year student, 
economics and political science. And we thought the third richest man in the world could sure give us some brilliant secret advice. He stopped chewing, stared at me, and then he grinned. Then he started chewing again. And then the identity, the moniker, Tony O'K, leading into Kafka, and these literary references, but with a wink still. Like, yeah, Kafka's well, not somebody you think of with a wink. Yeah, so tell yeah, me about yeah. the thinking there and how you came up with it. Was it a persona? Was the idea of a persona I, or just a know, pen I, I had taken, in my freshman year in college, I had taken a, college, or a, a continental literature class and got turned on to all those guys, some of whom I hadn't even heard of i don't know if i'd heard of franz kafka at the time you know uh, i think i had heard of thomas mann but anyway got turned on to all that and then bought and read everything except for the magic mountain it took me years to read the magic mountain it's like man <laughs> this is the the novel in which thomas mann tells you everything he knows <laughs> <laughs> right. i got to where you know, I had tried, started it years before, and then I decided, okay, I'm only going to read this in the winter in Idlewild, where it does snow. Uh -huh. And, you know, at a few pages at a time, it took me years to finish <laughs> it. So the, the idea of the name... Well, it was Steve up? Krikorian was not a very rock and roll name, and Krikorian... It's too long, no matter what. And I just, I like Tony O'Kroger. I like the story. Okay. You know, and I've had people ask me over the years, wasn't Tony O'Kroger kind of a gay thing? You know? And I went, you know, I never read it that way. I could see how it was interpreted that way. But no, I, I always read that as he was an outsider looking in. You right. know, and I, that kind of, it's how I felt at the time. So I liked that. And then the K is everything Kafka did, Joseph K, everybody. America K. with the K. Yeah, 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 all that. So it just seemed like, you know, I mean, once I got my record deal, it was like, change your name and wear dark glasses, you know? I'm full of house sex with you. We'll have the sex now. Were you having fun? Was was it enjoyable, that process of writing music and making your own records and oh, yeah. playing with a band and yeah, all that stuff? Yeah. Did you enjoy it? Yeah, once in a while, Rob Frabone will call me up, having listened to Food Chain again, and go, man. And I'll go, yeah, I know. <laughs> I hadn't heard it in a few years, but I listened, you know, sometime recently myself, and man, were those guys having fun. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it. Yeah. You know? The, uh, the the squealing and feedback at the end of hatred that sounds mm -hmm. either like a police siren or a whistle or mm -hmm. something, that's Earl Slick and Nick Van Marth with their amps in the echo chamber at Shangri-La. I mean, they're in the room with it is why those amps are hemorrhaging. <laughs> <laughs> Clive Davis, you had all these you know, major producers, major labels, a succession of them. 
session players and major rock stars playing on your records. Yeah. All, I mean, it was like everybody. It was inevitable. It felt you know that this is going to be, you know, this, this is, is going to big. this is going to happen. Yeah. Um, wow. Well. Don't know. Yeah. Don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I've almost, I don't know if I ever did apologize to J.I. Because J.I. took me aside when we were making those Nashville Crickets records and said, you know, you're going to get your own record deal eventually. So here, here's my advice to you. Always take the money. If they offer you more points and less money or more money and less points, take the more money, you know, <laughs> because most things will not recoup. You know, that's just sort of the industry standard is most things don't recoup, but the money is the money, you know, and if they do recoup and you're huge, you can renegotiate. <laughs> so, Interesting advice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, so yeah, but I've always I, I wonder if I apologize for not making it real big to him. <laughs> I mean, you know, obviously there were I don't know how many people over the lifetime of my career bought records, but something, you know. Well, it's interesting that today an artist that had the footprint that you had then would be considered a, successful. A, a big online yeah. success. Right. Yeah. Because there are lots of independent artists that are or even artists on boutique labels that would kill to have the kind of Yeah, I'm I'm guessing between Food Chain and America and um La Bamba and then the the what records probably between them all a hundred thousand people bought Tony OK records maybe. I bet you it's double or triple, huh? Oh, yeah. maybe. I mean, I still get uh, fan email. I was telling I was telling Tom this is probably more information than you need, but it's a good story. I get this email from a guy in Romania asking about the lyrics to Why Did You Rob Us Tank, the B-side of the Liberty record. <laughs> and he's tried to suss it out, and he's close, you know, and I had to go back and listen and figure it out, like, what did we say there, what? <laughs> and so, I, you know, I'm in kind of a little email exchange with him over a period of weeks, and it turned out what he wanted them for is he wanted to work up the song with his punk band in Romania to play it live. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's great. Well, wow, would that be something to see? More with Tony O.K. and Tom Willett coming up. Don't go away. Hey there, I'm Mark Feldbush and I'm a Patreon backer of the True Tunes podcast. And I follow and listen to the weekly Spotify gallery stage mixtape that John curates for us every week. I get to hear classic artists that I really dig and discover new artists. Every week, usually on Wednesdays, the mix is updated with around 40 songs from brand new releases to deep cuts and from across a wide range of genres including rock, Americana, indie, gospel, blues, sacred music, soul, and so much more. It's also great to hear a mix that blends great music that is just good, beautiful, and true without all of the genre and market limitations and boxes I hear everywhere else. You can find the mix on the front page at truetunes.com or on the show notes page for this episode. And if you follow it, it will live there in your Spotify browser and update automatically each week. And don't miss the massive archive list where all previous lists get saved. And as great as Spotify is for music discovery, please support the artists you love once you hear and discover them there. Thanks. Hello, I'm Chris, and I'm a Patreon supporter of the True Tunes podcast, which has quickly become one of my favorite podcasts. I can always expect John's warm voice and insightful questions to draw out the stories, wisdom, and faith of beloved and new-to-me musical artists. 
After every episode, I'm always listening with fresh ears to favorite albums or visiting new albums for the first time. Just like when I used to visit the old True Tunes store in Wheaton, Illinois, but now I can visit every week with new episodes. True Tunes Patreon supporters support the show with monthly donations of $5, $10, or $20, which helps cover the cost of producing and hosting the show. As a thanks for our support, we get early access to episodes and high-quality, lossless WAV files of each episode that we can download. We also have occasional Zoom meetups, some special live streams, discounts on True Tunes swag, and more. You can join me and the other patrons by visiting patreon.com slash truetunes or finding the link on the show notes page. If an ongoing patronage thing is not the right fit for you, but you'd like to give us a tip to help with the costs associated with this show, you can find links for that on the show notes page. Thanks, and enjoy. And we're back with Tom Willett and Tony O'Kay. What was happening? What was the transition between La Bamba and Romeo Unchained and the choice to work with what records? And we're honored to have Tom here, too. So what was going on? What There was obviously what being connected to the Christian market. That's a new thing. Right. What was going on? What what kind of changes well, the way, were going As I recall, the way that happened, and Tom can straighten me out, there was this guy, Tim Alderson, who lived with Mark Hurd, who was a lodger, roommate, I don't know what who hooked me up with Tom somehow. And I met Alderson through the vineyard in L.A., where I had started going with a girlfriend of mine at the time, at the vineyard, which was an out, uh, like a Bible an outgrowth of, of that Chuck Smith. Chuck or? Smith and John Wimber. It was the Jesus movement you were talking yeah, about Yeah, the before. Jesus guys in Orange of, County, right. yeah. yeah. The vineyard was an outgrowth of that somehow. It's I, the same... Bible study kind of thing that Dylan was a part of. Yeah, well, this was yeah. the very church that right. he and T-Bone and Mansfield and Souls and all those guys were a part of. I had actually, before I even went there, T-Bone was doing kind of this, an interview that was being filmed for some Christian TV show that somebody was doing. And, and he said, hey, I'm going to do this interview. You want to go with me? And I went, yeah, sure, whatever. Uh, I've n- I've never seen it and wouldn't want to see it. <laughs> but, but anyway, through uh, this guy, Tim Alderson, and Mark, we met Tom, and then Tom started listening, I guess, to what we were all doing. And, and T-Bone and Souls wound up in this first meeting with you, I think, and then we all gathered at some deli in the middle of the night or something. Was T-Bone part of, of you going to that vineyard thing or how, how did you found your way no there? i think he i i went with this girlfriend but i i knew him prior to and independent of that and he went oh yeah i i went to that church it's good and uh, you know i still talk to them now and then and then right after that was this interview thing but he and and souls and mansfield had been going there i guess a couple of years before i wound up there as he used to say People would say, well, did you get Bob Dylan into Christianity? And he went, oh, God, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> was your spiritual formation something that happened gradually? Did you have some sort of revelation that happened? Or was it Hal well, Lindsey you know, that, I, <laughs> that did it? Or Going what? back to those Armenian priests and their James Brown capes, yeah. I had just kind of always believed. Okay. I, I believed that it, it you know, that... that God is, and Jesus was, and is, and you know, I, right. I sort of always accepted that. I, I got churched 
through this girlfriend that was going to the vineyard, and that's when I started going to church. And then I became unchurched, not so long after that, but I still believe all of it. Yeah, so it goes back. It was part of your part. It was kind of. I was. I was inclined toward it. Yeah. So Tom, when when you you already knew T Bone and Mark and all those people, were, did you meet Tonio through that? Do you remember that? As I recollect it, I was in the studio with Mark, which was in a Ford box truck in his driveway. I say studio; it was where many great records were cut. But um, I had come in as the new A and R guy for Murr Records in Los Angeles. And my first job was to figure out who who did I just inherit? As a, I was like 16 artists on the roster. And I was horrified by most of them. <laughs> They're not what I thought music was or, and could be. And so I spent the first six months in L.A. Uh, letting contracts expire or just dropping artists. I got it culled down from 16 to five or six. And so then was my season of hunting for something I really could believe in. And Mark had already been on word through Chris Christian's Home Sweet Home label. And I met with him and realized, this is one. This is a great guy. So I was in his studio and I said, are there other friends of yours that do music like this that's smart and spiritual, but it's from a point of view that's broad and deep? And he goes, yeah, let me play a couple of things. And he pulled out some cassettes, and I've still got them. Um, And there was a band called uh, uh, Milo Carter and the... Lucky Stiffs. Lucky Stiffs. Lucky Stiffs, I remember that name. Yeah, Yeah, which Steve Hendelong from the choir was the drummer in, and I think Chandler might have played in it. And there was this guy with a funny name, Tony (laughs) O'K, and there was T-Bone. So as I recall, I met all of them through Mark. Um, and I took home those cassettes and started listening. And clearly the Tony O.K. stuff was the most developed and had both the lyrical integrity and the musical excitement that I was looking for. And so I realized that it, it would be irresponsible to sign Tony O.K. to Murr Records. I just couldn't right. do it. <laughs> and in fact... And he just wouldn't have done it, probably. Right. Tony O. said to me when I was showing him the paper uh, for him to sign, he said, really, I don't think you have any business signing me to a Christian label. Mm. And I said, no, contraire. And um, so we started what records, really, for Tony O. and for Mark Hurd because they needed a proper uh, distribution and marketing deal. We had a deal uh, with A&M Records, and I knew I could be competitive within the A&M system with these guys. Um, So the first Tony O.K. record was you had three or four tunes ready, Mm -hmm. Um, and then uh, that's certainly when I got involved with T-Bone, because he came in on that record, and he brought Maria McKee from Lone Justice, right. he brought Peter Case, yeah. and all of a sudden, my community started, oh, there are these smart, exciting people that are making, quote, Christian music, though they would never call it that, but I can sell it as that, because that's what it is, really. So um, it was Steve first, and then Mark invented the group Ideola, and, uh, which was all him, but uh, then that record, then Tony O.K. number two. Um, notes from the last notes, notes yeah. which was such a mature record. Uh, boy, did it pay off on the, the idea I was getting from um, the first record. Uh, that really delivered. And we got tremendous press. It was 
He had already been called the artist that had made the most important record of all time, multiple times. And this is mainstream press. This isn't like CCM. Yeah, yeah. This is people like Stereo. Stereo English, Review. Stereo and Review and Rolling Stone. Kurt, and Kurt Loader at Rolling Stone. Right. Um, the greatest album ever recorded. Yeah. And one guy said it's the best Bob Dylan. Uh, what was it? The, the, the best... Uh, Dylan, something since stopped making, stopped caring about making records or something like that. <laughs> To me, the the what era, which is short, it was the kind of perfect alignment of this idea that people of faith could, and I would say should, be making art at the highest level, and when they do, it can get respected in the general mm. culture. It doesn't have to be substandard. Like, to me, it was perfect. Everything about it was like, oh, now we've arrived. This is where mm. the... The U2, Peter Case, Lone Justice, all this stuff is going to finally kind of, we're going to find our, our island and, and people in the mainstream can like it because there's nothing on the Tony O'Kay records or the T-Bone records or the Mark Hurd records that's going to alienate anybody. Um, what happened? What like do, do you have a feel for why why were those songs not hits? Why was Stay not a hit? Or why was, why was Without Love not a hit? Breaking my heart to even ask the question. We're, we're still asking Sorry. ourselves. <laughs> but I mean, we're, we're in another era where this is now the same question. People are still trying to pull this off. And you guys were as close as anybody has ever gotten, I think. Those friendships, Tony O'K, Mark Hurd, T-Bone, Sam Phillips, were vital to my intellectual and spiritual growth. And the fact that we got to make good records. And it was my job to take the money from a corporation and give it to my friends what a great life. So for four or five years, yeah. we were knocking down some barriers and making some unbelievable records. Um, I remember uh, at a, a meeting that was Mark, Antonio, and I, and some other people, Antonio said, Mark, do you really think I belong on this what records thing? I mean, what what is Christian music? And Mark put on like a New York accent and said, I'll tell you what, uh, and Christian music is all about what you believe. It doesn't matter if you're no good. It's just what you believe. Unless you're famous, and then it doesn't matter what you believe. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow we developed a comfort level of me translating and being a bridge for Tony O.K. to words, sales force, and retail, and guys like you. You were essential in having the ears for this kind of stuff. You were already turned on to music with integrity and innovation. One huge mistake that I made, I don't know if I've ever told you this, uh, these guys haven't heard it, a huge mistake I made that had something to do with my sort of ethical core was, are you aware of when Rick Carroll, the program director of K-Rock, called me 
and wanted to have lunch with me and Gary Heaton, my manager at the time. He said, this was from the Romeo Unchained album, he said, uh, I think it was the song Romeo, Rick Carroll started K-Rock in L.A. He was the right. guy who was a you know, big deal music programmer. Uh, K-Rock was his idea and his baby. And then I had gotten to go know one DJ there in particular really well on the Food Chain album who heard my life on the Food Chain album and kept playing, I think it was either Hatred or Funky Western Civilization, over and over and demanding that I come into the studio. <laughs> he, he knew I, he was, he was, he his, name was, his name was Chuck Randall and his uh, nickname was the Midnight Lobotomist. Oh, I've heard about <laughs> that, yeah. And he had to meet me and he did and we're friends to this day. But anyway, Rick Carroll, the guy who ran the, the station, was then, K-Rock had become so successful by 1984 Five when when what year did Romeo come out? Eighty five. Yeah, um, he was programming Kiss FM in L.A. and a bunch of stations nationally in that Clearwater uh, conglomerate or whoever they were. So Gary Heaton and I meet him at the uh, Hilton in Pasadena, right across the street from the station, and he's telling us. You know, I'm getting really good phones at K Rock on, I think it was Romeo and Jane was the song. Like, you know, the phones are lighting up at K Rock. He said, but you know, well, we know what that means, kind of. But he said, I want to, I want to put this on the playlist at Kiss FM because I think we can push it through on, you know, the hit top forty radio in in America but I'm going to need a few thousand dollars to be able to pay off the right people and do what needs to be done. And like Heaton and I are looking at each other going, oh, God, payola, oh, no. Uh, I don't think we told anybody. And, and I realized years later what I needed to do was go tell Charlie Miner this and just let him handle it from there because that's what he did. And he was at A&M, and if we had just told him and washed our hands of it, uh, who knows, you know? Who knows? But, oh well. <laughs> what a career I'm having. The monster walked out of the garden Brushed the dust off his shoulders and straightened his tie really was amazing to, to hear and there were people there there definitely are people that still I, mean, I remember being at cornerstone 87 i think it was when mm -hmm. i was i think i might have had a pre-release of the of the notes record i'd been listening to mm -hmm. and you came mm -hmm. out and you you couldn't remember the lyric and at the first of of uh, executioner song oh, wow. and uh, i'm in the front and i'm screaming out the monster walked out of the garden and you came down here like what and i scream out. <laughs> and then you're like the monster oh, walked out of the garden and thank you and i high five thanks kid it was like but i remember you saying in an interview or some of the that the kind of energy and feedback you got from the cornerstone kind of people like that mm -hmm. that there was a population of people within the the christian world that w that surprised you to some extent you yeah, got you got some energy got there it. that yeah that was different and that it was got it and liked it <laughs> right right when you went into the notes from the lost civilization album and you kind of got you you mentioned it in, in passing tom but that record you really settled in with 
with David Miner producing, with all of these great musicians contributing. Of the arc of your mm. everything going back to the 70s, it's like this thing is just almost the culmination of yeah, that stuff. Yeah. It's, it and Olay are probably my two favorite of my records. I have a soft spot for Food Chain because it was my first record and we were having fun. <laughs> but pro- and, and of it and Olay, probably Notes is my favorite album I ever did, you know, coherent album love it i was just telling tom a while ago i forget oh we were looking at your song list and i was saying you know if i had to release one single to sum up my entire life's work it would be executioner's song on one side and we walk on on the other side Hmm. and if it was uh uh if it was an ep with four things on it then it would be uh funky western civilization and uh Probably hatred, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, no, I love that record. That yeah. was, you know, the, the way that came about is um, T-Bone and I sat down and sort of brainstormed it, like what songs and who should play what. And, you know, and we came up with, okay, we're going to have kind of the the funky soul side with James Jamerson Jr. and uh, Raymond James, the drummer. And and because Jack Sherman was funky as you want to be, you know, from the Chili Peppers to he played with George Clinton successfully. You know? right. so he was the real deal. Nutty as you want to be, but the real deal. Um, and then the other side was cast with those other, you know, with Keltner and, and all the other people. And it just worked. Now I don't know where the days go, they turn in. They turn into years Summers turn into Christmas And they all disappear And children turn from their childlike trust As their laughter is turned into tears Still they listen for the voices that we all used to hear They walk on It's interesting to me that it it, it segues right into where you go next. Uh, Olay to me feels kind of like part two of Notes, like it fits so well with mm. Notes. It didn't come out anywhere near when it was supposed to come out yeah nowhere you know, it, it near like seven forever. years later right, or right. something so i didn't hear it you know obviously for for those of us in real time yeah notes it was, was the last the, album the next year yeah right it was, well, um, was made the next year yeah. right but we didn't get to hear it yeah, until yeah. a lot longer but then you come out as a songwriter for pop artists and r&b artists yeah. and soundtracks and it's like what Ac- accidental a- but yeah same stuff so you had been on several labels. You had tried this several times by, by 1990 or 89 when when the Notes record was done and the Ole record was done and not even going to get released. Like, why yeah. that record, was it because what was was over? No, it, I, know, I know what it was because of. All right, I got a couple answers. What's yours? <laughs> I was, I think Carter told me, and he got this from Jerry Moss, I guess. Um a and M had been sold to Polygram, or was in the process of negotiating their deal. This is what Carter told me. I don't know what you know. And they were trying to pump up their bottom line so that they looked as valuable as possible as they're negotiating. And what did they wind up getting? Four hundred million or something for the label? Cash. Yeah, which made Herb Alpert the uh, luckiest trumpet player in the world. <laughs> <laughs> In the, in history, <laughs> right? But uh, I think Carter said he went in to Jerry and said, "Have you heard this this Tony O.K. record? You're not going to release." And Jerry went, "No," and he said, "Well, you should listen to it." And he said, "No, it won't matter." Yeah, and and. Carter went on. He said, "No, we, you know, we, we, we. I don't know what 
notes sold, but whatever it was, it and what they were into, it was the same thing. There was a Janet Jackson record coming, and where are you going to put your promotion, Tony O.K. or Janet Jackson? So they just decided to scratch the Tony O.K. project, and that was that. What I heard from other A&R people at A&M was that the new distributor, the new owners, said, y'all got too many releases. See this list of 16? We're not even putting those out. Oh, well. And lots of great records. David and David went by mm. the way, and you, and other mm. really good records. But they were, as they used to call them, work records. They weren't going to fly off the shelves like a Janet Jackson. Somebody yeah. had to actually have a plan yeah. and spend some money. Yeah. And they just, it got cut out in that distribution changeover. Yeah. Until seven years later, you finally prevailed on Until them Mi with your request. Well, Mitch finally prevailed on yeah. them. And, and Mitch ran Gadfly, a little yeah, indie label. Mitch he licensed yeah. it and put it out. Yeah, he him. went to work right. on them and got them to get off of it. Shot that picture But that was after you had started your kind of next phase of your career, really. Right. I had yeah. stumbled into the next phase of my career. Tell me about that transition. Well, well the, the way that went, there's a, there's a series of events. Prior to that, um, going through my first divorce with Linda, Tom and T-Bone knew I was just having a rough time. I mean, the record wasn't coming out. Uh, we were getting divorced. I was, and and you remember this, right? Yeah. And Julie had just come home from the hospital from a surgery she had had, where they were still in L.A. And this T Bone, is Tom's and, wife Julie. Yeah, Tom's wife Julie, and and T Bone and Sam and Linda and I were at their house to welcome her home, and Tom and T Bone are drinking gin. Bombay Sapphire, and I go, gin? God, I, I, can't, I don't even like the smell of gin, let alone the taste of it. And was it you or T-Bone? One of you said, never mind that, just think of it as liquid blue Valium. <laughs> T-Bone. Yeah. And I went, oh, well, okay, I'll try that. <laughs> and I went on a tear for the next 20 years, uh, uh joking with Charlie and his wife Karen in Austin that I was studying to become an alcoholic, which I guess I never became because I quit easily enough when I finally had to stop. But uh, same period, Charlie calls me up from Austin. He had just moved from L.A. back to Austin. Charlie Sexton. Charlie Sexton, who I, you know, he had recorded songs of mine on his first record and he and I had written songs for his second record together, and now he's getting ready to do his next album, but he's back in Austin, so he said, hey, you want to come hang out for a while? Let's write the next record, or let's write for the next record. So I went to Austin, and we wrote what kind of originally was going to be a Charlie Sexton record, but then became our cuts on the Archangels album. And during the same period, I had written Love Is with John Keller. My publishing deal 
that publishing deal was was with Pressman Cherry Music, Jolene Cherry, who was a publisher. She had signed me in 1992, I think. And I was just, I was writing with people around L.A. I had known John Keller all the way back to a previous publishing deal. And we had written Love Is, you know, because Keller was fantastic with melodies, you know. And he had one line in Love Is, which was, Love Breaks Your Heart. You know, I said, okay, I'll take it from there. I said, eh, that's kind of schmaltzy, but I'll take it from there and see where I go. And I might have been in Austin when, you know, she calls up and goes, we got this Vanessa Williams cut. And I went, Vanessa Williams? You mean Miss America? <laughs> you know, probably a very nice woman. I've never met her. And I'm just going, she's a, it's way too pop for me. I mean, on, on Love Is, truthfully, my first thought, and then I realized I, I don't know him well enough to ask for this favor, was to get Waits to sing it. Tom Waits. To call Tom that. Waits and get <laughs> him to sing that. Pretty much the same thing as Vanessa J- Williams. Just, <laughs> just to put a spin on that lyric. This is the thing about great songs. Mm. They can stretch way farther than most people imagine. Yeah, and you could hear that it might almost be more affecting if a voice like that sang it. And then um, during that period, I had written from Austin the lyric to You, the Bonnie Raitt song, um, and sent it back to Bob Thiel and John Shanks in L.A., and they had done a demo and gotten it to Bonnie um, and called up and said, Hey, Bonnie's gotten this. They went to Clapton first. I don't know if I ever told you that. And I don't know if he didn't hear it or he passed on it or what. But in the meantime, Bonnie had uh, had cut it. Then when I was back in L.A., she calls me up. She being? Bonnie Ray. Bonnie, okay. Yeah, because I had known her all the way back to Food Chain through Friboni, who had produced an album on her in 77, I guess, or 78. And she would come out to Shangri-La now and then. And uh, she calls me up, and she was there when, I guess I was playing Rob the demo of I Handle Snakes that we had done elsewhere. Rob Friboni didn't do the, the demo on that. But she calls me up because she wanted to talk about something in the lyric before she cut the song. And the first thing, she goes, Tony and I go, yeah. And she goes, hey, it's Bonnie. And I went, oh, hey, Bonnie. And she goes, I handle snakes, y'all. <laughs> I'd yeah. love to hear her do that song. Yeah. Man. <laughs> but uh, anyway, then she asked me the question about the lyric, and I explained where it was. She said, there's this one lyric that strikes me as little too hallmark you know and i said which one and she's i forget which one it was actually and then i explained oh i know what it was it was uh isn't it love that keeps us breathing isn't it love we're sent here for she went "Eh, isn't it love that keeps us breathing i don't know you know uh and i said well i'll tell you the literally the visual image i had when i wrote that line was of somebody an older person laying alone in a bed with 40s film noir uh, Venetian blinds open and light coming in, who's just laying alone in the bed, and you see the covers going up and down, and then it stops. And that was that. I said, that, that's where I was coming from on that line. And she went, oh, well, okay, I'm good with it. <laughs> you know, oh, wow. I'll, I'll take your word for it. Isn't it love that keeps us? Isn't it love we sent here for? Whoa. 
wasn't that love that we were feeling was something, baby, deep in our soul, deeper than we know, keeping me whole out for you. So anyway, what happened then is uh, I, w- I had this band, 16 Tons of Monkeys, in Austin, which was a you know revolving cast of characters, some of them, all of them great players. Because I got 16 tons of questions for the teacher. You know, I just, I frankly never liked performing. I, I nerve, too nerve wracking, carcinogenic stress before going on stage, you know. And then I just started, I, I got to where I'm going, what is this? I'm standing here hoping people are going to like go like that after I open my mouth, you know. I'm going, okay, I think I can make a living for life writing songs. This is good. Let other people, you know, let Charlie go out and sing them if he enjoys that sort of behavior. (laughs) So even when you were doing notes and the other record, it was the process of recording. Yeah, it was writing 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 the song, remaking it, and... But but playing live was never something you liked. Never something I enjoyed. No. Right. Always why, you know, going all the way back to the Rake's Progress, you know, we did have costumes and capes and goofy stuff going on on stage. I mean, we were young enough to be having fun with it then. But, yeah, I just, I guess I, I don't like people looking at me. Yeah. And that's not, not a healthy attitude if you want to be in show business. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> But it, but it's probably good for you to have a moment where you realize that about your stuff instead of staying on a path that's going to make you miserable. Yeah, well, but you know, sadly, in retrospect, uh, thirty years later from those days, that's where my career would have been if I had just forced myself to keep doing that. Then I could have could have done it because with streaming, you know, the sort of your royalty stream has been gutted with streaming. They walk through the door and the room falls apart And dressed for the kill they will conquer the wandering heart They lay on the pages of some magazine Undressed and airbrushed Unreal if not quite obscene Dream girl Burt Bacharach. I, I got to find out about how do you connect with Burt Bacharach oh, yeah. and Dr. Dre. Like I, God, that. That's I just have to hear about. Same that. thing. Uh, Jolene Cherry's publishing company. Um, they call me up one day and say, Bert Bacharach is looking for someone younger and kind of edgy, whatever. He had just done his stuff with Elvis for that record and kind of enjoyed... Costello. Yeah, Elvis Costello, (laughs) not Presley. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But, uh, you know, it was asking around or something. You know, I think uh, his publisher... And a girl named Daniela Capretta, who was uh, working for Jolene, had had lunch or something, and his his guy Bob and her had been talking, and somehow it was decided that Bert and I should meet and see what, if anything, came of it. And so they hooked us up, and something came of it. I've been hoping for a better day. It's a long But I wait anyway Till the dark clouds have all blown away And the sun shines again 
And the Dr. Dre thing was down the line from those days. Uh, I forget years now, but that was probably somewhere up around, uh, somewhere in the early to mid 2000s. I forget when that record came out. My publisher at that time, a guy named Steve Lindsay, called me up one day and said, do you think Bert would be interested in working with Dr. Dre? <laughs> I went, well, now, there's a juxtaposition I wouldn't have thought of, you know. But he was somehow wound up being Dr. Dre's piano teacher. Um, and he said he was, you know, showing Dre chords and things. He had said to Dre, you know, you should get together with someone like Burt Bacharach and, you know, maybe he, he could do something that you could do your thing on top of, you know, you should do something like that. And apparently Dre had said, yeah, great, put that together, you know. So he, Steve called me up and you said, you think Burt would be interested? And I went, I don't know, I'll run it by him, you know. So we went out to Dre's studio one day and he played a bunch of beats at just terminal volume and, like, <laughs> Whoa, you know? and sent Bert home with these beats and Bert lived with him and he did whatever you call that. I always describe that record as somewhere between the Gershwins and Stravinsky with Bacharach top line melodies. <laughs> So these collaborations that you've been doing for the last 30 years, to me, one of the things they reveal that, especially with the students that I work with now, I, I think they provide a really good example of uh, how our concept of coolness can mm. really limit our capacity to understand beauty when mm. it comes mm. to, and, and even truth, uh, mm. when it comes to art. Yeah, uh, I'm, I, as I've said, I'm the only, I, I'm sure I'm the only guy in the music industry to have written lyrics with and for both Steve Jones of the Sex Pistols and Burt Bacharach. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. But what have you, what, what can you tell us about that growth that you've been able to experience when it comes to transcending uh, cool? The Burt stuff in particular, he is so specific and so protective of his melodies and what he's doing like i would you know and one one time i remember and he would listen to me there were a few times but he'd always consider it but one thing i, I would say like and i was just able to do this and it's probably not easy matching those you know 16th notes and the stuff he's doing but i said to him once you know i don't i don't don't remember what song it was even i said if if this was Instead of da 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 da, if it was da da da, I could say this and it would be way easier. And you know, we were already into the lyric, I was we were putting the song together, and he went, huh, and he played it and tried it, sang it to himself, and then went, nah, the other way is right, you'll get it, <laughs> <laughs> and I did, you know. Right, right, right. So, you know, that was just. I mean, how do you not write with Burt Bacharach? That's like someone calling up and saying, hey, Beethoven needs some lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody help me 
Or like he said to me once, he said, hey, I'm, I'm writing a song with Brian Wilson. Um, I've never written with him before. I, I, I actually just met him at a Grammy function. At, they were all at the same table. And someone said, hey, you guys should write together. So he said, I'm, I'm going to write a song with Brian Wilson. You want to write the lyric? And it's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> what could not be great about a song with Brian Wilson and Burt Bacharach? I guess Brian had the melody for the chorus, and Burt came up with the verses, and... And then I sat there listening to it with my legal pad as they're working it out on the piano. I have a photo of Burt Bacharach and Brian Wilson sharing a piano bench. Thought, Which song is that? Uh, it's called uh, What Love Can Do. It was like, wow, look at this. Burt Bacharach and Brian Wilson sharing a piano bench. It was like, hey, you guys care if I take a picture of this? <laughs> I, don't, I don't do this often, if ever, but... <laughs> Look, look at what I'm looking at. <laughs> yeah. I fear that a lot of young artists, young people, just they wouldn't even know uh, the significance of a moment like that because they're yeah, not being no, exposed no, no, enough no, no, to no, the no, music no, no. from before the last five years. Feels like I'm flying here. No time for crying here. Tom, when you look back on this story, both personally, but also you've been a teacher, you've been working with students, you've been a producer, you've done so many different jobs in the industry. Bass what, player. Bass player. I mean, yeah, <laughs> you know, a musician yourself, you know, but when you look back now on this story and, and what he's done and the transition that he made from artist, very cool artist, very cutting edge to songwriter, to supporting other people in that what, what are some takeaways that that we should be pulling from this story? What are some lessons I, or I some ideas, some inspiration? Through, yeah, I think the lines. through line for all of Tonio's work, from the most outrageous to the most uh, palatable. Uh, palatable. <laughs> <laughs> I won't go any further than that. <laughs> no, uh, to, from uh, Rake's Progress to Burt Bacharach stuff. The through line is love. He yeah. only writes about one thing, and he believes it. He, ne he needs it. He needs to give it. He sees the centrality of it, what it means to be a human. And so I, I, I can ride with that, you know. And uh, then the second part would be just his, his humor that's in almost everything. Yeah. Yeah. I think, was it Mark Twain that said if, if you're going to try to tell people the truth about their lives, you better make them smile in the process or they're mm -hmm. going to come after you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. But, yeah, that's good. That's good.
Well, man, thank you so much for taking time with us today. Oh, are great. you are you working on music still? Are you not much in the last couple of years? I, as who is it? Some oh, I won't even get into who. Somebody wants to write, wants to write, wants to write, and I just went, man, I'm way more interested in reading than writing these days. Any final words of encouragement or advice or counsel or inspiration for? Oh, some gosh. 17 year old out there picking up a guitar or sitting at a piano for the first time kind of looking at the horizon you know i mean this is going to sound flip but it, it, it's almost serious i i would say unless you can't help yourself don't do it you know i mean as you know to go back to bert again he kind of was asked a similar thing by the wall street journal 10 years ago now or more than five years ago and he said, uh, how can any kid these days get into the music business? How can you write a song and make a living with streaming? You make, you know, we used to make a nickel a, a cut when a record would sell or, or whatever they made when a jukebox would play your song. He said, now it's point zero zero one two eight cents per stream. And the example he cited was... Uh, that song beautiful the Christ, uh, what's her name Christina Aguilera is that who sang that yeah. yeah he said that song was you know a huge 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 international hit the last quarter of of the royalty statement for that song which i'm sure ascap provided him with the statistic it had been streamed more than 10 million times in a quarter and her and the writer uh, Linda Perry her royalty was something like three hundred and twenty-nine dollars or something. He said, "So how can you make a living doing that?" You know, sorry, kids. <laughs> <laughs> and if you somehow get stuff on TV or in a movie or in a commercial, they can't screw you out of that yet. I'm sure they're working on it. <laughs> you know, right. but they actually have to pay for that. Right. So, yeah. well, thank you. Thank for taking so much time. Yeah, it's been John, a real honor my pleasure. Talk to you. I really appreciate and it. I do enjoy the show. I, I, it's my, uh, to the extent that I exercise, it's my exercise music. Oh, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I listen to your shows as I'm trying to stay in shape. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate and, it. And don't let anybody think I work out. I don't. Am I, <laughs> my, the mantra in my life is I will, uh, I will run nowhere unless someone is chasing me. <laughs> and I will lift nothing unless it actually needs to be moved. <laughs> right. But now I have to try and deal with this spinal situation. There you go, there so. you go. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Absolutely. Thanks both for being part of the conversation and for having us into your yeah. your home. And mm-hmm. that's great. And thank you for helping facilitate all that stuff. I don't think those records would ever come into being if you hadn't have done what you yeah, did. Yeah, really. Great time. Really. Well, I don't know when. Well, I don't know when. Well, I don't know when. Thank you, Tony O'K, and thanks, Tom Willett. Make sure to check out the special Spotify mix that I've pulled together blending some of Tony O'K's best songs as an artist with some of his most significant covers as a songwriter for others. You can find the link to that on the show notes page for this episode at truetunes.com slash Tonio1. As I pull out my soapbox here to wrap this up, 
I am still overwhelmed at the profound impact a supposedly failed artist has had on my life. And how bizarre and beautiful is it that this guy, who got his start in the psychedelic rock era, then cut his teeth playing with Buddy Holly's band, was primed perfectly to act as a sort of bard for the end of an age. His faith was energized by the Jesus movement, but unlike those who saw that revival as an opportunity to create and hide out in a subculture, Tony O'Kay and his compadres stayed engaged with the wider world, with their hope, their faith, their love, stirred honestly and authentically into their work. And while Tony O'Kay's music may not have been successful by traditional industry metrics, the excellence of his work inspired many to go on to have success of their own in other ways. His work as an artist also sharpened his skills as a songwriter, preparing him for that second career. I think if you zoom out far enough, you have to see that this is a success story. But above and beyond Tony O'Kay's stunning accomplishments as a writer of hits is the way he modeled a sober, realistic, but still romantic notion that love is there waiting at the gate, just outside the garden, in the midst of the damage and the destruction. Notes from the Lost Civilization is a project I return to regularly. It is also one that cemented my desire to become a songwriter and storyteller myself. As ragged as Kay's worldview seemed, he wasn't ready to give up on love, and I wasn't either. And little did I know that his sober take on love, the abiding kind of love that worked itself out amidst pain and failure and wounds and heartache, would become the vocabulary of my pursuit of the love of my life. These adult songs about love and the kind of faith that is strong enough to last through the night helped me love Michelle better, to defend her, to risk for her. When I started True Tunes back in the 80s, I was consumed by the idea that music like Tony O'Kay's deserved a wider audience than it was finding. Interesting that here, almost 40 years later, I feel exactly the same way. As we release this episode, I hope a new generation of listeners, maybe some 16-year-olds like me back in 86, and some in their 50s or better, will discover this music for the first time. But when I think back to those amazing albums and all of the What Records releases in the 80s, I wonder if things would have been different if the folks who might have fallen in love with these records and artists, if they had ever been given a chance to hear them, had actually happened upon them. Instead, they were promoted on one hand by a market that really preferred music that reinforced their growing Christian subculture, and on the other were promoted to a popular culture that just didn't care. Somewhere inside that mainstream culture though, and somewhere inside the church, there were people interested in excellent art that asked the right questions and sounded good as it did so. I don't think anything has really changed all these years later. Finding those people is the challenge. Who are the young artists traveling this road today? Will they find the audience they need in order to eke out a living? Will they survive long enough to get really good at what they do? Will they hear about the great books, the amazing films, the songwriters they should be listening to? And what about the audience? What about that kid like me in the 80s looking for streetwise love in a broken world? Will they find it? Will they find the songs they can sing along with? The songs that will help them imagine a love worth fighting for? I hope so, because man, my life would not have been the same without the soundtrack I had been playing in the background. And Tony O.K. has been, and continues to be, a big part of that. We're here. True Tunes is here. I am here to find and encourage the artists and the audience, come what may. Because it really is worth it. Okay, I'm climbing off my soapbox now. That's going to do it for this episode of the True Tunes Podcast. Thanks again to Tony O'K and Tom Willett for hosting the interview and just being so awesome. Thanks to Tom Galata for the extra recording help on this one, too. And thanks to Randy Layton, Bruce Neer, and Jeffrey Cotta for hooking us up with so many great musical K rarities. You can find the special Tony O'K Spotify mix on the show notes page for this episode. 
head to truetunes.com slash Tonio1. We'll have the complete music list there and more as well. And Patreon members, make sure to keep an eye open for a special exclusive mix courtesy of Bruce. Which of course reminds me, thanks as always to our Patreon backers. And if you would like to join the group, head over to patreon.com slash truetunes. Or if you'd like to give us a one-time gift, you can find the PayPal link on the show notes page as well. And thanks for doing all that other stuff, leaving us the ratings and reviews at Apple Podcasts, subscribing to the weekly Spotify Gallery Stage Mixtape, and signing up for the email list. This podcast was written and produced by me, JJT, with co-production, editing, and sound design by Bruce A. Brown for Gyroscope Productions. Our theme song is a special instrumental mix of Full Circle by Phil Keggy and Rex Paul. The contents of the program are protected by U.S. copyright law and are the intellectual property of Gyroscope Productions, with the exception of songs or clips that are from previously copywritten materials. Everything on this episode is used by permission or under fair use provisions. Thoughts and opinions of our guests do not represent the positions of the producers or our sponsors. Discernment is recommended. This program is intended for the private use of our listening audience. Gyroscope Productions can be reached at JJT at TrueTunes.com or P.O. Box 60401, Nashville, Tennessee 37206. Until next time, this is JJT asking you politely, stop the emotional war games in the name of love. Stay tuned and stay true. Peace. Do it again. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I was going to say, you know, when you said what, 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 what is your comment on all his life and music and whatever, and I was going to say, what a waste of time. Why? <laughs> 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 or or <laughs> who? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>